The following is a production of Phoenix Media. The views expressed do not necessarily represent those of the company or its advertisers and may contain language that's unsuitable for younger listeners. You're listening to Be Kind Rewind with Tim Nidell, taking you back to when movies were actually good. Are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? When music wasn't auto-tuned. When TV only had a few channels. And now, here's your host, Tim Nidell. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to a brand spanking new episode of Be Kind Rewind with your host, Tim Nidell, which of course is me. I would appreciate it if you would follow me everywhere except for in person, of course. But you can find me online. It's at Tim underscore Nidell, N-Y-D-E-L-L. I've got a website, actually, and believe it or not, it's at timnidell.com. Got some cool stuff on there. I got some merch. I got links to my YouTube channel, just in case you want to follow my YouTube journey. Some of these celebrity interviews that I do for the show are on there. I got some Disney trips. I got some vlogging trips to Comic Cons, stuff like that. I think you guys will really enjoy it. Again, just check out timnidell.com. And of course, on there, I also have this podcast, Beacon Rewind, which I'm loving. Hopefully, you guys are digging it too, because I love doing it. And for today's episode, I really, really enjoyed doing this interview because I'm such a big fan of his work and the movies he's been in. And of course, I'm talking about Julian Glover. He played General Veers in Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back back in 1980. He was in For Your Eyes Only with Roger Moore. He was in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets where he voiced Aragog. And of course, he was in one of my all-time favorite movies, Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade. A movie that I have loved since I first saw it in the theater in 1989. I remember exactly where we were, too. My family and I were on vacation in Oregon. We were actually going camping in Oregon, and we drove by a theater there, and they were playing The Last Crusade. And we all loved the first two Indiana Jones movies, so we had to go see this one. And I have been addicted to this movie ever since i remember when i bought it on vhs so to to set it up i'm from reno nevada so gambling was everywhere slot machines were seriously everywhere you would go and uh, we were at the grocery store and i think i had maybe 10 bucks or something i don't remember how much it was but my dad wanted to you know put some into the slot machine and uh, he asked if he can borrow my ten dollars and so I, i gave it to him He put it in the machine, and he actually won. I don't remember how much it was, because I think I was like 10 years old when this happened. So I don't remember how much it was, but he paid me back my $10 and gave me some extra on top of it. And uh, I remember they had a VHS copy of The Last Crusade at the grocery store, and that's what I spent my money on. And uh, it might sound bad, but my dad is not a gambler. I promise you that. He just, I I don't know, he just kind of wanted to try out the slot machine. I know I know it sounds bad, but uh, he only gambled a few times that I remember, honestly, as a kid. But anyways, one of my all-time favorite movies ever since I first saw it, and it's still remarkable. It still really holds up today. And of course, he played Walter Donovan on that movie and has one of the best scenes in the movie when it comes to the Holy Grail near the end when he dies. Spoiler alert. (laughs) But that scene is just remarkable. And of course, we talk about all that and much, much more in my interview, which I will be playing as soon as we get back from the commercial break. Behold my process. Ooh, yeah, let me tell you something right here, Uh uh-huh. It's the Loot Crate subscription box, yeah, full of exclusive loot on surprises and delivered to your door every month. Just pick up your favorite geeky genre, daddy. <laughs> <laughs> From the original Loot Crate, the Loot Crate DX collectible boxes, dude. Cowabunga! To the Loot Gaming video game box. Woohoo! Yeah. To the Loot Crate video box. What's with kids today, huh? 
Browsers! With crits starting as low as $11.99 per month, those are packs just about for all collectors. To get your geek on, head over to phoenixmedia.us forward slash loot crate and claim your exclusive offer. That's F-E-N-I-X media dot U-S forward slash loot crate. Great Scott! Snap into a loot crate, dig it! WWE Superstar Alberto Del Rio, take one. Behold the angry giant. Try it again, Alberto. Behold the angry giant. Perfect. Good luck tonight. Behold the angry giant. Yay! Read me another one, Dad. This is WWE Superstar Alberto Del Rio. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. This is Mario Andretti. You know me as a race car driver, but I'm also a Meals on Wheels volunteer. I've raced against the sport's biggest personalities, but I've never met more vibrant, amazing people than the seniors served by Meals on Wheels. You can make a difference by dropping off a hot meal and saying a quick hello. So, America, let's do lunch. Volunteer your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. This message brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. People been saying to your friend, get a different face. And posting on their feed, they're super ugly. The things they say to them online are cruel and they're not true. So tell your friend, I'll stand up for you. Don't worry, I know what to do. Know someone being bullied online? You can be a witness and make a difference by letting the world know it isn't cool. And by letting your friend know you care. Learn more at eyewitnessbullying.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Hope you enjoyed your meal. And I just want to say, he's lucky to have a brother like you. Lucky? Caring for my brother is far from easy. But he's a part of me, like my arms and legs, so I'll be his. No time for tired. Nothing can disable this love. He needs me. But I'm the lucky one, even though I need help now and then. If you're caring for a loved one, visit aarp.org slash caregiving for care guides and community. Support for your strength. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. You're listening to Phoenix Media. Listen live and explore more great shows at phoenixmedia.us. Hello. Hey, Julian. How are you doing today? I'm very good, thank you. And yourself? What time is it with you? (laughs) It is 8 a.m. right now. Oh, you poor thing. You just got out of bed. <laughs> I did, maybe about 20 minutes ago. I set everything up last night for the interview and just left my computer on. And, and How woke. are you feeling? Are you feeling, have you had a shave and a, a, a shower to get... Not Get yet. Not interview? not yet. So I'm not quite presentable. <laughs> so good thing we're not on camera right now. <laughs> now what can I do for you, sir? Well... I'm such a huge fan of your work. I just wanted to look back at some of your previous work and talk about it, if you don't mind. No, that's quite That's what I'm here for. Excellent, excellent. Our show kind of reflects on the past quite a bit. I, you know, I talk about my childhood quite a lot, you know, with movies that I grew up loving and a lot of your movies I grew up loving. What was yeah. What was your childhood like as a kid? Oh, it was nothing. Well, I don't think anybody of my age uh, had a childhood like you had, um, because there wasn't the proliferation of stuff which we have now. Yep. Um, I mean, there were so many outlets or inlets of uh, cinematograph uh, expression that, uh, and the, in my day, there weren't. They, I, we were lucky to go to the cinema at all, because, of course, I was brought up during the war, the Second World War. And uh, if we got to see... I don't know, Snow White, we were lucky. Um, and there was no television then. So we didn't have uh, that sort of experience which you've had. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things to choose from. Uh, may I ask how old you are? I am 41. Yeah, well, you're a young man. Mm-hmm. And then uh, 40 years younger than me. <laughs> and uh, 45 years younger. Oh, Julian, Christ. Uh, <laughs> uh, 45 years younger than me. Uh, so your experience would have been quite different from mine. Mm-hmm. We didn't have all the things like Star Wars and, 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 and um, uh, but the Bond film franchise, the Indiana Jones, all those things. It wasn't like that in those days. There weren't things called franchises then. 
And so, as I say, I was very lucky to go to the cinema at all. Uh, I occasionally used to go to what's called Saturday morning for children. And uh, you go to that and see lots of sort of funny adventure films, which were a quarter of an hour episodes and things like that, which we all found terribly exciting, of uh -huh. course, because we'd never seen television and going to the cinema was wonderfully exciting. And you usually had uh, an ice cream when you had that. So that <laughs> was good. So comparisons between your your childhood and mine don't actually work. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. I, you, you've been brought up in a, in a in a sort of culture of cinematic experience. We weren't at all. It was just a treat. So you said you actually did en get to go out and enjoy some of the Disney films, the animated films? Oh, yes. It, well, you say some of the Disney films. I mentioned one, and that's the only one I can remember. Um, it, the films on the Saturday mornings were all uh, episodes of things with one bound Jack was free, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And, then, it, and uh, then you'd have to wait till the next Saturday to see the next episode when you saw how he got free. Uh, it was that sort of thing. Uh, we, we led not protected lives, but it just wasn't part of children's culture to go to the cinema. Uh, that shows how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that you were a uh, shy boy growing up. Was that true? Well, I was rather shy, yes. Uh, uh, I had a good childhood, really, despite the fact that my parents separated. Uh, but I had a good childhood with... Uh, a lot of very good influences in it and uh, good siblings. And uh, I enjoyed myself, generally speaking. I was a very outdoor boy in the beginning of my life. Uh, we, I spent a lot of time uh, in the woods. Uh, I lived in a place in, Br in Bristol, London, in England, uh, called Lee Woods, which and I spent a great deal of time in that uh, with the local ranger's son and um, bashing around, s scratching our, our, our knees and... Um, <laughs> and getting our fingers all dirty, yep. and, well, like kids do. Um, it was that sort of bringing up, a uh, very open, a uh, very open air one. And then I went into London and we came, I started going to ordinary schools and that stopped. And uh, But my parents were very, what I call liberal people, um, very far seeing. They could see uh, my potential. So mm -hmm. when I decided to become an actor, uh, there wasn't the usual objection that parents normally gave, oh, my God, my son's going to be an actor. <laughs> it was, thank God, my son knows what he wants to do. <laughs> and um, they encouraged me in every way. Uh, so I was very fortunate in that way. In doing theater and, and acting, did that kind of bring you out of your shell? Oh, gosh, yes. Uh, that started at a school I went to in South London, which was founded by one of Shakespeare's actors. Oh, wow. Um, a man called uh, um, Al Edward Alleyne. And he um, got older and made some money. And uh, <laughs> I think as a sort of um, uh, little gesture to him upstairs, um, founded a school for, for poor boys in South London. And uh, that lives today in two schools. And when I went to mine... Um, called Alleyne's College of God's Gift. Um, there was a new master there who decided he was going to set up uh, Shakespearean Productions, which is something which should have happened there all the time, mm -hmm. with that mm -hmm. name of the school, or that foundation. However, it, w it hadn't happened, so he set it up, and he did a production, uh, an open-air production of Julius Caesar, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, and uh, chose me, and I, I'd never done any drama before in my life, mm -hmm. I say, as you say, being rather a shy boy, um, never occurred to me, get onto a stage, you've got to be joking, I couldn't do charades at Christmas, <laughs> I was so shy. Uh, um, anyway, he cast me as Mark Antony, which is one of the showiest parts in Shakespeare, as you yeah. know. And um, I played that, and couldn't believe the, the, the sort of the feeling of, of what it was to to enact someone else and to act someone else's emotions and things. That didn't do it. The next term, they did a thing called a Gilbert and Sullivan Opera. Do you know of those in America? I don't. You don't? Well, they were... They were Gilbert and Sullivan were a writer and a composer who composed these light comic operas. And um, they were very, very successful uh, from the late uh, 1900s onwards. And in fact, they're still performed. 
And one of them, there's a very, very good comedy part of, it uh, doesn't matter who he is, who has a thing called a patter song. But dick dick the sort of thing that, uh, uh, I'm trying to think now who would have done that sort of thing. Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, and I, in that, felt, probably for the last time in my life, as well as the first, <laughs> what it was to hold an audience at the palm of my hand. Uh-huh. And uh, I came home that night and said, this is what I want to do. And they fell on my neck with gratitude and uh, said, OK, we'll do well if we can to help you. Where wow. should we go to drama school? Et cetera, et cetera, things like that. That's so rare, like you said, for, for parents to be OK with that. Oh, so rare bat. for them to... And actually, you've got to be joking. I know. So I say they were very liberal people and very left-wing people. OK. Um, and very, very much into the arts. Both my parents were journalists and uh, very much into the arts and went to the theatre and things, and my mother started taking me to operas at the age of about 11. Wow. And um, so, so I was in that right sort of atmosphere. So they didn't have any objection to a child of theirs going into the artistic area, uh-huh. uh, which didn't happen with my sister or my, well, actually, my half-brother is a rather well-known pop musician, so um, wow. this is a different branch of the arts. <laughs> But the parents were very tolerant of all that. I'm not tolerant, encouraging. And um, let us run our own course and let us go out into the world and do that damn thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's talk about a little movie that you did called Star Wars Empire Strikes Back. That, that little thing. Yeah, <laughs> that, that little thing that I that, think that, I've that, heard that of. That 15 minute, 15 minute student <laughs> movie, you mean. <laughs> Yeah. Star um, Wars, yes, I remember it. It was a long time ago. It was. <laughs> <laughs> I understand you received the role in quite a unique way. How did you come to well, be... Well, you heard all this, I, I did hear the story, yes, but tell my audience, yeah, okay. how did you, you get the part? Yeah, okay, you your program. Um, well, I was in my garden one afternoon, and next door to me happened to be a chap we very much liked, who was a co-producer on very big movies in the States, and he'd already co-produced Star Wars, the first one, and uh, there I was mowing the lawn, and he poked his head over the fence, uh, chat, chat, chat about this and that, and he said, oh, I'm, uh, we're making this, this sequel to Star Wars, do you want to be in it? <laughs> and having been blown over with excitement with the first one, uh, like all we young, well, everybody was, not just mm-hmm. young actors, uh, I said, well, yeah, well, he said, I'm afraid it's not a very big part, but it's quite significant, and it only take you a week. Would you would like to do it? I said, yeah, yeah, thanks very much. So I went in and did it, and got General Veers, who was, a, you know, he's not a large part, but he, he is a remembered part. Yes, yeah. People always remember him for the Battle of Hoth and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after that, several years later, uh, another nepotistic movement was made, when uh, my neighbor uh, called and said, uh, can I put you up for the Nazi officer in uh, the next <laughs> Indiana Jones film? And I thought, oh, Christ, <laughs> Indiana Jones film? Yeah, yes, you certainly can. I went along for that and uh, didn't get it. Uh, and I came back home and disappointed. Uh, but there you were, and I phoned my agent and said, I know I haven't got it. And he said, no, uh, a friend of mine, uh, um, Michael's got it. I, I said, well, that's much better because he's much better casting for it. Michael Byrne, uh, much better casting. They said, and they said well, uh, but actually they want to see you for Walter Donovan. I, having just skimmed through the script like you do, mm-hmm. Walter Donovan appeared on rather a large number of pages. Mm-hmm. I said, that, that, that's the villain in Indiana Jones? <laughs> he said, yes. I said, but they want to see me for that? Yes. So I went along and did um, a thing called an American accent, um, which was obviously good enough to pass. But of course, when I did the film itself, um, I took coaching lessons and I hope I got it right. And, uh, and I got that. So another nepotistic move in my career. So, so <laughs> really, your, your neighbor had a huge part in your, in your career. Indeed, he did. He was called Robert Watts, still is called Robert Watts. Okay. He doesn't work anymore, but um, anyone who's really into, into movies and that sort of movie would certainly know his name. He quite often appears at, um, at conventions, Star Wars uh-huh. conventions and things like that. Uh, and he's a lovely fellow, but he, he doesn't work anymore. 
Um, but yes, you're quite right. I mean, every time I see him, I, I, I sort of kneel down and do a <laughs> thank you, Robert, uh, to him, because he, he was a very, very big influence. Yeah. But I hope I justified his trust in me, but um, <laughs> that's another matter. <laughs> Most of my family, they never graduated high school, so I'm trying to break that barrier. My daughter, Brooklyn, was also a motivation for me to go back to school. Every day after work, went straight to school, and it paid off. At age 26, Kareem finished his high school diploma. I could not have done it alone. I see the future is really bright for me. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. So I'm a cat, and I just moved in with this new human, and she's got this little toy she's always playing with, all day long. Tap, 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 bloop, bloop. She can't put it down. There it is. Oh, and get this. She even talks to it. Last week, she asked it for Chinese, and guess what? Egg rolls showed up, like magic. Humans have cool toys. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the ShelterPetProject.org. What if I told you that a tornado was going to happen tomorrow, right where you live? That it would touch down at exactly 3.17 p.m. and I told you the exact path it would take. You would, of course, prepare. You would talk with your loved ones and you'd make a plan today. It's true, I can't tell you a tornado will strike tomorrow. But shouldn't you have a plan anyway? Go to ready.gov slash communicate and make your emergency plan today. Don't wait. Communicate. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. I spend a lot of time in the backyard, and I'm the center of attention at summer barbecues. In 96, I made some of the tastiest s'mores. And in 09, it was me, your backyard fire pit, that accidentally started a wildfire when a summer breeze carried one of my embers into some dry brush. Spark a change, not a wildfire. Visit SmokeyBear.com, brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. Only you can prevent wildfires. My name is Lola Silvestri, and I'm going to be 95 this year. I was very independent. I fell, and I had to have meals on wheels. America, let's do lunch. One in six seniors faces the threat of hunger, and millions more live in isolation. Drop off a hot meal and say a quick hello. Volunteer for Meals on Wheels by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. This message brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. Hey everyone, let's all stop what we're doing and take a moment. You see, every moment can be kind of special. But they could be loud moments, goofy moments, dorky moments, it doesn't matter. Because every time dads like us take a moment like that to spend with our kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's take a moment to make a moment. Call 877-4DAD411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. You're listening to Phoenix Media. Listen live and explore more great shows at phoenixmedia.us. What was it like working alongside David Prowse, who, of course, at the time was the voice of Darth Vader and, of course, wearing the suit? What was, what was David like back then? I didn't really get to know David very well. I mean, he was he, he was there normally underneath that helmet, um, and actually he was rather private. He'd, he'd go back to his dressing room between shots and uh, not sit around talking to you. Uh, uh, very private man. Hmm. Um, worked terribly hard on that for those films. I have to say, he learned all the parts. Learned the parts absolutely dead letter perfect so hmm. when he had scenes with people there was never any problem with him you know he couldn't read it or anything like that because he was inside that mask yep. and it had to be recorded but of course as we know it wasn't his voice they finally used um which upset him slightly oh, he yeah. he sort of couldn't understand why his voice was not being accepted and uh well you know between you and the gate person the rest of the theater going world his voice wasn't good enough um <laughs> uh but he did the thing of being Darth Vader terribly well. He moved it, moved it very well, and gave the right timings for the lines and, and all that. 
uh, and I only discovered recently that we went to the same school when we were young kids. <laughs> um, we both lived in Bristol, as I mentioned, um, and Bristol Grammar School was the local um, sort of best school, really, except for public schools. Um, and I found out only about five years ago that he was in exactly the same class and used to sit in front of me. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but we never didn't know each other then at all uh. as kids. Uh, and we got on fine, you know, uh, 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 in the evenings when people would congregate in the hotels. Um, he'd sit there, um, not saying very much. He's a very West Country man. He had a very strong mm-hmm. West Country accent and uh, Bristol accent. And uh, we got on fine, um, but no friendship was there, so you can't build anything out of that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. In Empire Strikes Back, of course, there's that big twist that Darth Vader is Luke Skywalker's father. I'm assuming you probably didn't know that until you actually watched the film in theater. Is that correct? Uh, absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Uh, I didn't know any of that stuff. You know, we went in... Uh, I don't know what we came in as. There were these f- four young lads came in to, to play these young officers. Ken Colley being one, and, uh, uh, and he was the admiral. And we just went in for five days shooting, and we did we didn't have access to the rest of the script. Um, I uh, came across my scenes uh, with delightful surprise because I had some text in them. Mm-hmm. I had that n- nice scene with Darth Vader, which was very good, uh, and then I did the Battle of Hoth inside that great fighting machine. Mm-hmm which um, I did sitting on a gantry with a blue screen behind me <laughs> and a sort of uh, workshop-type uh, control panel in front of me, which was never used in the film. Um, and I was jiggle around a lot uh, <laughs> and moved <laughs> um, in front of the screen. And I didn't know what I was sitting in or fighting with until I actually saw the movie. Oh, wow. When I, when I did, walked down first came on, I turned to my wife and said, Christ, that's me and that giraffe. <laughs> and, giraffe. <laughs> and so I didn't know until then that uh, <laughs> that was the thing I was, I was, I was driving. Um, so that was our experience on the film. Uh, we actually all got on very well uh, for five days, and we see each other quite a lot now when we go to these conventions, except one of us has just passed on, mm-hmm. passed on a few years ago, so, which was rather sad, but... Um, you know, we've all got to go. Yep. And uh, so we do without him, bless his heart. Um, but the, 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 the camaraderie on the set was very good. And, and it was well directed and sympathetically directed. And uh, although we didn't actually meet the main protagonists in the film, we were taken over to the other studio at Pinewood where they were working on other things and introduced to them. So when I came to meet Harrison Ford again with Indiana Jones, yes. um, we could say, oh, hello, we met in that studio, <laughs> and um, we sort of knew each other a, a little bit. Sean Connery, of course, while, we jump, while I'm jumping about films, I'd known from, from very early on, from when I was about, I don't know, 24 or 5, when oh, I wow. did a long Shakespeare series in, in England uh, on television. And... Uh, and he was involved in that, um, so I'd known him. So we'd known him. I'd known him on and off, not terribly well, but well enough to mm-hmm. be very pleased to see each other at parties and you know f- film premieres and things like that. Uh, so I was particularly sad when he went. But then everybody's a terrible loss, aren't they? Yeah, you know what I mean. That's so true. Yeah. That's so true. Let's talk about Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, which is easily my second favorite movie of all time, and it has been since I saw it in the theater when it first came out. Such a remarkable Who's film. Who's the first? Which is the first? The first one is Back to the Future. Oh, right, okay. Oh, that's brilliant. Yes, you're quite right. <laughs> so this is your second best. My, my okay. second favorite, yep. Right, r- rather a hard comment to come up to. <laughs> <laughs> and you played, like you said, Walter Donovan, the good slash bad guy. And you did it so well, uh, remarkably well. And up until probably like a handful of years ago, I didn't know that you didn't have an American accent. So you, you fooled me. 
well, that's nice. That's very nice. I can tell you a story about that, which I've no doubt you know. Uh, am I going to tell you the story you know? Uh, is it about Spielberg? Uh, yes, Spielberg, yes. But we've just done the scenes. I'll, I'll tell this for your program. Of course. Uh, we've just done the scenes in the desert, which had been very grueling and um, hot and uncomfortable, sitting inside or standing inside that tank, which you know, the temperatures are 37 degrees outside, and very, very tiring indeed. Um, but at the end of it, we were happy because we knew we got good footage and, and all that. So I was just standing, so as it were, mopping my brow at the end of it when Stephen came up to me and said, Julian, you know, it was such a good day. And I, your American accent is just, it's so good. You'll never stop making American movies after this. <laughs> and I've never made one since. So. <laughs> no. This surprises me, though. That really, would, when I heard you say that, that surprises me. Uh, that's the passage of our business. <laughs> doing that film was a great, great pleasure. It's, it's working with those people, you know, uh, they were just, you, you just knew you were in the presence of something terribly special. Mm. And anything they did would be bang on right. And uh, they hardly needed any direction. But if they were given some by Stephen, they would bang on do it straight away. No fiddling around with the edges and saying, oh, I don't think he would do that. Or, uh, oh, is that in character, do you think? <laughs> that sort of stuff you sometimes get from actors. They didn't, they didn't do any of that. They simply did as they were told and acted it simply brilliantly. And uh, being in that company was a very invigorating thing to me. Uh, at all, at all parts of it, right through the movie. Uh, and we laughed a lot, I have to tell you, uh, because the whole idea was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> was, um, what was Sean Connery like on the set? Well, Sean has, has always been um, very generous with himself. Not a, not a man who goes around making a lot of jokes um, and keeping the company alive in that way any more than Harrison was, who's a very private man, uh, but very courteous and very interested. Um, there was nothing he wasn't interested in, and uh, because I'm mainly a theater actor, he was um, very interested indeed in the work I did in the theater, not generally specifics, um, though he did ask about those, and I was able to ask him about his movies, of course, um, but uh, the, the experience of being a theater actor which he said he could never do, he could never have done. And he, when he started off doing it at the very beginning of his career, he was absolutely lost and didn't know what to do with it. Um, and then found movies and became, as, as we know, one of the greatest stars that ever mm -hmm. lived. Um, uh, so we enjoyed each other company like that. Uh, uh, he was a, a very good ch chap to have on set to sit around chatting with afterwards, uh, but also he was terribly busy. So he kept on running back to his dressing room to, to metaphorically lift his telephone and do do business hmm. because, uh, well, as I say, because he was such a busy man. Um, a, a very good man uh, also. Um, and I mean that in its most essential sense. Um, a good man hmm. um, who had no harm to find in anybody, always find the good things. And, of course, which endeared him to me of was solidly a Scotsman, which uh, I, by birth, am, oh. um, but never lived in Scotland. Hmm. So that appealed to me mightily. Mm -hmm. And his, uh, his work in trying to promote the independence of Scotland uh, used to, used to um, amuse me and interest me very, very much. Had long talks about that. <laughs> so that's what you would talk about on set with him quite a bit? That sort of thing, yeah, okay. yeah. You, you talk about, on set, you know, you talk about anything with all sorts of people, whatever their interests are, what are your other interests are, um, your family, you discuss, you talk about your family, you discuss yep. your family, or if you're free, you discuss, you know, the ladies who might be in love for, in, in your life. And uh, you know, like anybody else, we in, in a pub or a cafe or, or a bar, you know, you, you, you talk together and just chat about their lives and what's interesting you and um, what's, what's difficult or easy about this particular movie. So, so why can't I remember the words in that scene? Um, could you help me through it? And, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Everybody's out to help each other. And uh, 
mostly on films. I've very rarely been on a set where people weren't helpful. Um, I've been on un unhappy sets, but not where people weren't helpful. I wanted to help each other out of problems. Uh, <clears throat> so there you go. Dear John, I'm leaving. Uncontrolled high blood pressure is serious, and I can quit whenever I want. Why can't we get back to when you checked on me? I don't want to leave. But remember, when I quit, you quit. Sincerely, your heart. Listen to your heart and don't let it quit on you. High blood pressure can lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range today. For help keeping yours at a healthy range, text PRESSURE to 97779. A message from the American Heart Association, the American Stroke Association, and the Ad Council. WWE superstar Alberto Del Rio. Take one. Behold the angry giant. Try it again, Alberto. Behold the angry giant. Perfect. Good luck tonight. Behold the angry giant. Yay! Read me another one, Dad. This is WWE superstar Alberto Del Rio. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. It may be hard to believe, but people just like you are already saving money. FeedThePig.org makes it easy. Their simple savings plan teaches you how to start saving without going overboard. So you don't need to sell all your belongings and live in a commune. These dungarees belong to all of us now, Tom. You don't need to get a second job as a stuntman. We need a new stuntman! You just need FeedThePig.org. Don't get left behind. Get tips and tools at FeedThePig.org. Brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. Welcome to Calvin's Barbershop. You all got to see this. I don't even want to know what you're looking at on that phone. Well, you should. I was learning about the dangers of high blood pressure and that we need to get ours checked regularly. High blood pressure can increase the risk of heart attack or stroke, but this text program can help keep it at a healthy range. Just text Barbershop to 97779 to sign up. I'll get right on it as soon as I'm done with this baby panda video. <laughs> <laughs> text Barbershop to 97779. A message from the American Heart Association and the Ad Council. My process. Ooh, yeah, let me tell you something right here. Uh -huh. It's the Loot Crate subscription box, yeah, but with exclusive loot on surprises and delivered to your door every month. Just pick up your favorite geeky genre, daddy. <laughs> From the original Loot Crate, the Loot Crate DX collectible boxes, dude. Cowabunga! To the Loot Gaming video game box. Woohoo! Woo! Do you need free gearbox? Yes, we can stay, huh? Wowzers! With crates starting as large as $11.99 per month, those are packs just about for all collectors. To get your geek on, head over to phoenixmedia.us forward slash loot crate and claim your exclusive offer. That's F-E-N-I-X media dot U-S forward slash loot crate. Great Scott! Snap into a loot crate, dig it! You're listening to Phoenix Media. Listen live and explore more great shows at phoenixmedia.us. Speaking about being on set, tell me about the sets for the film. Were they as remarkable in person as they were on film? Oh, yeah. Absolutely extraordinary. We went to wonderful locations, of course, um, uh, out in Spain. You know, lovely locations were built out of the side of mountains and things like that. And the exterior um, of the... Oh, no, that was done in... Yes, Lebanon. I was thinking of the exterior of the, the caves. No, that mm -hmm. was in the Lebanon. Um, but they built beautiful sets back in England, too. We, we, we filmed at Pinewood Studios in England for a lot of the interiors. Um, a lot of the, in, the uh, Venetian in, interiors, which I, I didn't go to Venice, grr, grr, because um, <laughs> he, my character, didn't. Um, they, they were built at uh, Pinewood, and they were absolutely brilliant sets, and um, really caught the atmosphere of Venice, I thought. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, really, really, really good, and... Uh, well, yes, and as, I, as I say, the exterior sets, too, were wonderfully hewn. I don't mean, 
hewn with pickaxes, I mean, created from local modern conditions, mm. you know, like a particular wall might be a very use. When I sold that, when I gave that car to that, that, um, that whatever she, he was, mm. um, that great big Rolls Royce, there was a wall there, which he, which was an old wall, which just existed, um, which they took that wall and adapted it into the, uh, as it were, square yeah. uh, that I was wow. showing off the car in. That's the sort of thing they do with such brilliance. Um, mind you, I have to say, the sets that were most, most brilliant of all in my whole career, and uh, let, let's face it, it's very small um, amount of my career was spent <laughs> in the whole of f the film world, um, was the sets for... Uh, 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 God, Julian, come on. Um, um, <laughs> Game of Thrones. Oh, yes. Um, absolutely fantastic. Fantastic sets. We walked from set to set and go, oh my God, uh, the, the, the money they threw into those sets. Um, but you know, you're quite right, the Indiana Jones sets were, were terrific. And also there were, Stephen, you know, he, he if he can avoid CGI, he does avoid it. Um, yeah. Like My Death, for instance. Um, that was done like, two months before the film started I went out to Pinewood and the and these makeup people created a, a, a death mask of um, of my face um, you know a plaster of Paris thing mm -hmm. which they then took away and they worked out the prosthetics from my slowly crumbling face uh, from it um, and that sequence was so well worked out uh, it was not done with CGI except at the very end because I couldn't act as skeleton. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, each single moment of that was worked out in advance, and he shot it in the old-fashioned way, which is by cutting and, uh, and cutting away to other things in between uh, things that are happening to my face. The whole thing only took 16 seconds, mm -hmm. and it was absolutely brilliant the way he did it. But he didn't use CGI for that. And a, even... He, you know, he did a lot of um, um, the Gentle Giant. Um, was it called Gentle Giant? With, with um, yes, with Mark Rylance, mm -hmm. uh, where he was a giant. Mm -hmm. but he did a lot of that, not as a giant. He did a lot of that without CGI and um, photographed it in the right way and had the sets made in the right way so that um, Mark Rylance could appear to be a giant in that set. Uh, he always goes back to the old ways if he can. Like the, quite a lot of things he does in the movie um, are homage to uh, other people. For instance, the f sequence in, in my Indiana Jones when he, he's, he's in the, the, the lorry and he goes underneath the lorry uh, and he's still wearing his hat, which is simply brilliant. He comes out <laughs> the other end still wearing his hat. Uh -huh. That was a pay-in to John Ford in um, Stagecoach. Okay. When John Wayne went underneath the horses mm -hmm. and underneath the the carriage and came out at the other end, still wearing his hat, <laughs> that that was a tribute. And quite often, Spielberg does that. You might say, "Why am I walking towards it?" He said, "Oh, Julian, I don't know. It's because Spencer Tracy did it in <laughs> Bad Dad, Black Rock. It won't show in a film, but I'd like you to do it." <laughs> you know <laughs> that sort of thing he would do. Absolutely brilliant man. I loved working with him. So loved him. Such a nice man. So he's, he and, uh, sounds like he's very much like a child, you know, playing the well, director. Well, sort of. It's, 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 a, it's a, a toy with which he has exactly, expert a toy. knowledge. He, he can do anything on the set except act. And um, <laughs> <laughs> as a result of which, as opposed to those directors who can do everything on the set and can't act, who loathe actors because uh, they can do something they can't do, mm -hmm. he adored actors. And uh, he loves what actors can bring to something. And if you did something on the set which was not quite into the script, but you invented that, he would either accept it, if it was good, or reject, say, I don't think that's a good idea. Hmm. Um, let's go back to the original. And, and, uh, but he, was, he loved actors making things up as they went along, which didn't mean you didn't learn the script, because the script was the basis of what we did, mm -hmm. obviously. Yeah. I'm talking truisms here. <laughs> <laughs> so there were a few things that I found out while doing research for the interview that I wanted to 
you know, almost kind of verify it was true because, you know, the Internet isn't always 100% accurate. <laughs> Is it true that you were being considered for the role of James Bond? Yes, um, but among other people. Uh, I'd just done a series of um, sort of quite that sort of thing on television in England, um, playing that sort of sort of hero not not like that but i i, I was a contender and um i auditioned for it and did a screen test for it and oh, didn't wow. get it and i'm not surprised because i wasn't very good i i, I didn't <laughs> find a facility for that sort of wonderful slickness and um mm-hmm. and total confidence with i don't know a, a pistol in my hand or whatever i i did it fine you know i i did it and and I think I spoke the lines with sufficient intelligence and with a, an idea of how 007 might speak, having got Sean uh, to, to, to be as a model, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't do it with a Scottish accent. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I knew I wasn't very good. Uh, but also, all of us, I think there were about five of us who tested all on the same day, and we all met. But all of us knew in our hearts that um, the saint had just finished oh, yes. production, and that Roger Moore was an absolute dead ringer for the next Bond. Yeah. And we knew that when we were doing it. And indeed, two weeks after we did the tests, James Bond was announced as Roger Moore. <laughs> and um, so we all suspect that um, it was them doing us of doing the favor of the business and, and uh, you know, testing unknown people for it. Um, I don't think with a bad grace. I think it was a, 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 a sort of a compliment to actors' equity that we 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 did do this thing. Mm. And had we found someone among those those five young men, uh, we would have used them. But I think they always had it in mind to have Roger, yeah. and how right they were. Oh, absolutely. In my opinion, Roger, I thought was absolutely brilliant. Absolutely. Anyway, a, you know, different yeah. from Sean Connery, so we add a different flavor to the Bond but, character. You know, well, they all had a different flavor. I'm sure it was absolutely uh, was Sean's man. He, he and he embodied Bond, didn't he? He did. Until Sean, until Roger came along, and then suddenly there was this larky fellow um, <laughs> who had a joke for every every scene, um, was was very funny and but extraordinarily good at all the stunts, like Sean was, and was extraordinarily attractive to women, like Sean was, mm-hmm. um, and he who was a apparently enormously enjoyable to work with on the set. And when I came to do mine, mm-hmm. uh, my Bond film, I found exactly the same. And he became a great <laughs> friend. And <coughs> he was different from, 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 from all the other, other Bonds. Absolutely. Because uh, they were all completely different. And yep. different. They were good in different ways, except for one uh, who, who collapsed. But um, I mean, the performance, in my opinion, collapsed. Well, won't go into that now. That's that done. <laughs> so another thing that I read, um, you were the first person to suggest Pierce Brosnan as a uh, potential Bond in 1980. Is that true? Well, um, I don't know whether that is... I remember suggesting him when I was doing my Bond. Mm-hmm. And the reason was that his girlfriend then was in the Bond film. And uh, sh- he was... Piers was always sort of knocking around, quite understandably. Absolutely glorious girl she was in every way. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was there. And uh, I remember it was one dinner when we were discussing Bonds, and uh, Piers wasn't there, but his girlfriend was. And I said, of course, Piers would make the most wonderful Bond, wouldn't he? And, uh, you know, the conversation went on in other directions. And that was the only time I said it, and I had no idea if it had filtered through to yeah. the powers that be. But I think probably that's that could have been what happened. Um, though mind you, by that time, by the time Piers got it, he was very well known. He'd done Remington Steele yep, and, yep. and, and was a very well known actor. Uh, but it could be. I mean, I've always thought, well, it could be that that, that <laughs> dinner was the time when when the seed was sown. <laughs> and, and yet, but I can't an, claim it. Another great Bond as well, too. Oh, he, he was. Oh. Such a good man, you know, Pierce. Mm-hmm. Such a good man, and he's pulled his life together after the death of his girlfriend. I know. You know, she died tragically young, and um, a, a terrible loss. We, we still, we still sort of. 
I've got her picture up in my house. We, uh-huh. Wherever we look at it, we think, how did that happen? How did wow. it, that, that terrible thing happen? Anyway, it did. So wow. there you go. Wow. Uh, final one, um, that you were being considered for the role of Dumbledore. Well, yes. <laughs> There's another one I missed out on. It, <laughs> um, I was rather good at doing um, Richard Harris at that time. I could sort of do his accent and uh, and sort of get along with it like that, uh, the way he was sort of playing it. And uh, I was old and was whatever um, um, it was taken over um, by Michael Cambon. What was that, 20 years ago, 15 years ago? I don't know. Uh, but I was uh, availability, as they say. But it never got anywhere, never got anywhere near an interview or a screen test or anything. Okay. Um, but I was availability, so I can say that I was considered. And I think I would have been damn good. And I really do think that. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think Michael Gambon's terrific, mm-hmm. but I think I would have been very good indeed in that part. I think I would have brought a sort of um, a steely thing to him, which um, we haven't seen in the Dumbledores yet, which uh, I think he could, he could do with. But that is not saying that I don't think that both the Dumbledores, mm-hmm. have, Dumbledores have been absolutely superb in their parts. And, uh, and I, I really do mean that. That's not not a jealous actor trying to make up for it by being nice. It's, uh, I really do mean that. I was sorry I didn't get it, but I didn't. You know, that's our, that's our business. Exactly. A lot, most people's <laughs> careers, or no, a lot of people's careers are dogged by having just been near something and didn't get it. And um, there you go. There was a, I mean, I've had in the, in the theater world the same thing. I, I missed playing a tremendously important Shakespearean role at a time when I was doing a movie, and um, I won't go into it, but the actor who played that part has never looked back since. And, um, wow. you know, these things happen. And yep. uh, here I am, 86, I'm still acting, and I'm very comfortable. Thank you very much. And I've got a gorgeous wife and a wonderful son and some beautiful <laughs> grandchildren, and so I'm as happy as a grig. Exactly, and thing, things <laughs> work out, you know. a career for you. Things happen for a reason. That's why I always felt, you know, things happen well, for a reason. Yeah. So in in a hundred years, when both you and I are gone, how would you like to be remembered? Well, this sounds very arch. Um, I'd like to be remembered. I know I am now, by in certain quarters, as someone who was really nice to work with mm-hmm. and always produced the goods. Uh, I don't want to be remembered by any particular role I played. I played so many, you know. I've, it's a, I've had a very, very varied career, uh, from major movies down to poetry readings in bookshops. And uh, that's not down to, but that's the sort of range. Uh, and doing uh, li- little workshops in schools and things like that, and teaching students and... Uh, not teaching them, taking them through the paces, etc., etc. Uh, so I'd just like to remember it as a, as a good fella, a nice fella you like to get on with, who always produced the goods mm-hmm. uh, in his work. And I think that's about as big a tribute as I could hope for. Well, all right, Julian. Thank you so much. Seriously, thank you so much for your time. Big fan of your work. This is a huge honor to have you on the show. Well, thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm most flattered that you wanted to talk to me and to talk to me in such depth. I do hope you can make something of what I've given you. <laughs> Cut it all together to make me sound nice. That's the point. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Julian, thank <laughs> okay, you. Thank, thank you so, you so much. much. For yep. Bye. Bye bye now. Thanks for listening to the Saturday Morning Rewind. Please check them out on Facebook and Twitter. And that's all, folks.